I think the best analogy I can give people is, you know, that they're buying the second one and their nose is still around water level. There is a high likelihood that any pressure gets put on your shoulders or your head, you're under. Welcome back to another episode of Multifamily Strategy, the podcast. I'm Christian, your host. I'm joined today by Matt, the lumberjack landlord, great friend of mine, one of the best investors I know. Can't say enough good things about him. So I've been extremely excited about this episode. And we are stoked to bring him to you. Matt, welcome to the pod. Oh, man. Super excited to be here. Doesn't get any better than this, right? Dude. So a little background on Matt, and I'll let you tell your story. But Matt is, is recently retired after a long time being very frugal and high income with a high income spouse on top of being one of the best investors I've ever known. He's built a huge portfolio. Uh, Matt has made it to what we call... Very rich. Well done. <laughs> Technical term. <laughs> no, no, the rules for being rich, at least in our book, a multifamily strategy, you have to have equity, you have to have cash flow, and you have to have cash. You have to have all three resource pools at the same time before you're rich. Now, if you've heard my backstory at all, uh, I usually don't have cash. I'm still building my portfolio. I do not count as rich. Matt counts as rich. If we're wondering what the, the metric is, that is the metric. Matt has made it. And we're interviewing winners here. Goal of the podcast, by the way, this entire thing, we want to bring the owner meeting to you. It's the most valuable thing you can do. So I'm meeting the best owners I can around the country. Matt, you qualify on every metric that could possibly matter. So thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, Matt, give us a little bit of your backstory. Mm -hmm. Like we're going to talk about where you're at today, but let's hear a little bit about where you started the first deal that you did. And then, you know, just give me some of the path to like, where did you start and why was it important that you started? Yeah. So where I started, uh, thanks again for having Christian. Uh, looking forward to it. Um, where I started was I started <clears throat> as a ninth grade dropout. Um, so everyone in every room is more educated than I am. And if you aren't, then we should probably go get a soda. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it, it was, um, you know, it was really out of necessity. You know, I had gotten a job and, you know, ostracized from my family because I didn't, I wasn't going to go to college and I told him I wasn't going to go to college. In fact, I told him I was going to finish high school. Um, and then just realized, you know, it was, it was all about the grind, right? I was working three, four different jobs. I mean, it was, it was just nonstop. And then I uh, got into tech as a telemarketer. My first contract I signed was for $18,500 a year, um, plus a whopping, you know, $2 bonus per lead. <clears throat> and Ooh. so, yeah, Big massive. Spender. Yeah, massive. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's how I broke in. But then, uh, you know, being in tech, everybody was always talking about the market. And this is, you know, uh, 1998. Um, I get into tech uh, in 1998, 1997 and uh, start working in tech. And then the whole reason real estate became a thing was because my mom and uh, was a, a, an agent growing up and she was a single mom. And so I used to spend my Saturdays in the car going on showings with her. And this was when real estate agents used to take around their their uh, their clients in their car. You know, oh. before what it was now where it's like they take them separately, but, uh, or they drive their own, but, uh, <clears throat> got into the stock market, got my clock cleaned in the dot com bomb and went from every single penny that I'd saved up for, you know, a year, year and a half. And I was living frugally then too. I was living with a buddy paying 250 bucks a month for a room, um, and, uh, lost it all. I lost like 30,000 bucks in the stock market. And I was like, okay, feel like it's rigged. I'm never going to live in Manhattan. I'm never going to be in those boardrooms so I can find out what the you know non-insider trading move is. Um, and so then I started looking at it and saying, I got to get into something. I need a place to live, number one. Number two is I got to get into something that, um, that I feel like I can learn, I can get better at than others can get. And most importantly is it's a necessity you know, something that's required. And so then I started looking at it and saying, <clears throat> you know what, it might make the most sense to start buying real estate. And so I bought, uh, uh, one of my biggest life lessons was I bought a condo. <clears throat> that was a huge mistake. I bought it on the water, just outside of Boston, looking at the ocean. Um, and uh, within six months of buying the place, so I, I literally was like, I can't afford this place on my own. So I'm going to buy it and I'm going to have a roommate under lease, put somebody, one of my buddies gave, got, got him under lease and then I could afford to buy it. And they would count the, they would count my income plus his rental income um, because he was a roommate. 
<clears throat> so they were willing to count that right away. Uh, bought the place, uh, moved in. And then about six months later, I got hit with a special assessment. <laughs> and the special assessment was $83,000 on a $350,000 condo. I've never shared the story. That's exactly where I started. I did a condo with a roommate. Uh, it was a mm-hmm. fixer upper. I bought for I, I mean I bought for less than that. I bought it for like one eighty. Uh, but we got part way through. I got a sixty thousand dollars special assessment on a condo I bought for one eighty. I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> I was like, um, I called the called the condo association and I was just like, hey, so I can appreciate that you're like handing out bills to people. Let me just let me just help you understand something. I'm 23 or 22. I don't have $80,000. It's not going to happen, guys. It's not going to happen. So you're going to have to figure out what's going to what that's going to look like. So after having that kind of bitter pill in my mouth, I was like, "All right, we're going to get out of this and get into a single family home." Thankfully, we'd had some appreciation then, just a little bit, not a ton, but we'd had mm-hmm. enough appreciation there where I could get out of it and basically not have to write a check to sell it. And that was the goal. So that's what I did. I got out of it. I sold it and I bought a single family house and then I got roommates and the plan worked a little bit better there. But the thing that I didn't like about it was, okay, well, as a roommate moves out, you know, we get another one in here, but then it's a couple of months lag in between getting the right person. And, you know, does that really fit? And it was like, yeah, you know, I mean, I kind of have deemed, you know, living with roommates and when you own the property, I've kind of deemed that a super hack, you know, that's kind of a super hack. Um, and so I was just like, you know what, this, I don't love this, but it's fine. I'm not home a ton. So this kind of works out. Um, then I changed jobs and was living at home, working at home and everyone was around all the time. And so I was like, okay, we definitely got to change this. So I then started looking at how do I buy real estate and, you know, other investment properties. But at that point you didn't have a 5% down mortgage that you get on a small multifamily. You know, it was a a bigger investment. And so the only way that we could do that was I'd save up a bunch of money again because I don't spend money. I drive, even now today, I drive an 06 Yukon with 180 something thousand miles on it. Mm -hmm. I don't do but can. And just looked at the market. And then the biggest mistake that I made, I, again, I picked the wrong market. Now, where did you, where did you buy for that first one? Manchester, New Hampshire. Manchester, New Hampshire. Okay. And what makes that the wrong market? So it was the largest populist mark, most populous market that there was in the state. It was a little over a hundred thousand people. <clears throat> the The problem was is the building stock was almost all old, really old, like eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds old. It was also a very rough area. <clears throat> it was a very rough area, and so. Um, the quality of housing wasn't there. I can promise you the quality of tenant wasn't there. <laughs> um, and so that was what the biggest issue was. And after I'd bought into it and I, I kind of bought some stuff that was kind of like fixer upper um, and fixed it up and I still couldn't get a great tenant. And so I still knew that it was the right thing, but I just languished there. And then uh, the, the, the next biggest stupid tax that I got was I got a lead order. On one of my buildings. Ah. It's not something that's very common outside of New England. Mm -hmm. uh, But in New England, it's a very common thing. Um, Meaning that it happens to... uh, There's about 300 houses a year that get hit with a lead order um, in New Hampshire. And the funny thing is, is that there's probably about 33,000... Uh, properties that have an issue that have a tenant that could be susceptible to a lead issue. So for those unfamiliar, what is, what does a lead order look like? Like you're the landlord, you have no idea what this is. It's coming in. What, what actually happens? Uh, you get an, you get a email <clears throat> or a letter from the state saying that somebody was flagged for high lead levels in your, in one of the apartments that you own. And I was lucky enough for that to happen to me in 08. Aha. A perfect <laughs> time for things to happen in real estate. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, this is bad. This is really bad. Um, and so I start doing my research and I'm like, oh my word, this, this is crazy. And, you know, whether you agree with it or not, it's the law of the land and you're mm. going to have to figure it out. You got to find a solution. 
And so I think that was one of the biggest challenges. One of the biggest challenges was finding a solution. So I looked all over the place and I literally just said to the, to, said to the state, I said, I'm probably just going to give you the house. I'm just going to have to declare bankruptcy. I said, I, I, I don't have the $45,000 that you're telling me this is going to cost. <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we do in the course that we, that I made was I teach people how to get through a letter order because it's very expensive. It's very technical and you need to be able to hold the state reps accountable <clears throat> for what they're doing and what they're saying. And in our state, coincidentally, there were only five contractors certified to do abatement. Really? Yeah. That sounds difficult to work with for the whole state. Granted, your states are a lot smaller than they are on the West coast. One but... point. Yeah. We're, we're, our state's only 1.3 million people. Um, but you still got 300 buildings a year and you have five contractors bidding on those 300 buildings. I'd imagine business is very good if you're one of those five guys. <laughs> Almost as if you could name your price. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do so, as an investor when that comes up? So, so you, you mentioned two things. You had a HOA issue, a special assessment, assessment yep. that kills your deal. Yep. You have a state that comes in and says, hey, guess what? Bonus expense. Realistically... You wouldn't have underwritten for that. You would not have expected, hey, of the millions of people here, I'm going to be one of the 300, right? Yeah, I mean, if you do the math, right, 33,000 units with people that could potentially have a lead issue, and you've got 300 a year that they hit, well, what's the math? That's 1%. Yeah, and that's something that you probably don't factor for. So when the unexpected happens, because it's happened to you multiple times, yep. uh, I mean, what do you do? Did you declare bankruptcy? Did you find a workaround? Like, what does it actually look like? So I think the key is that I'd engage them and I just said, I think I'm just going to give you the house and then everybody, everybody can become homeless. That's my option. That's, that's the only option you've painted me in a corner. I don't have $80,000 or $50,000 to fix this. Um, there, I have no options. I can't get a loan on the building. It's 08 in case you hadn't heard the entire, you know, real estate economy has collapsed. There's nothing here I can do. And so I said, um, I said, is there any sort of a program or grants or anything like that? And then they mentioned, oh, well, you can actually, there is a, there are a couple grants and there are some, you know, ways that you can take out a loan against the property. And they basically would do a, an interest, uh, an interest, a 0% interest loan on the property. But now I have a second position on the property. And so they allowed me to do that. It was the project ended up costing for three units and ended up costing about $80,000. And that's work that I could do today with my crews. I could do that work for about 20. It's about a four X. It's about a four X cost. Wow. And that comes down to you have contractors who can name their price. That's usually what's going to happen. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And so, um, they said they could do it in 90 days. It took a year. And insurance doesn't cover lost rent for such a thing. So the, one of the sticky rules with a lead order is that you actually have to pay for your tenant's rent wherever they end up. And they have to pay you rent. But if they stop paying you rent, you can't evict them. Ah. Double that sounds like uh, That sounds like Washington State. Yeah. It's a, it's a win for them and a loss for me and a loss for me and a win for them. <laughs> um, so, so that was, that was the biggest challenging, most challenging part. And it was, you know, thankfully we had some people that just basically DQ out of the process, stopped paying rent. And then we're just like, you know what? I'm just going to move somewhere else. I was like, thank God. And then they moved somewhere else. And then, you know, Mike, the, uh, the lead guys got access to it and they stripped it and they redid it. And at the end of the day, I bought the property, right. But I didn't buy it so right that I had room for a 20% increase in costs of what I paid for it to then make the numbers work for rent. Yeah. At the end of the day. So even though it was at 0%, the challenge was, I was like, all right, I know someday when I sell this, I'm basically not going to get a dime of my money back. What does your portfolio look like today? We've talked a lot about the beginning and yeah. issues that came up as you were building and we'll dive deeper into that. But sure. where are you at right now today? Unit count, most exciting project. Talk a little bit about what your business looks like after you made it. Only slightly different. Um, so, so 20 years later, it's, uh, 145 units, uh, 51 buildings, um, you know, from the finance side, you know, no partners, no equity partners, no partners, partners. Um, I, my name's on, my name's on all the mortgages. 
um, well, through a trust. So we we put everything in a trust, and then we just max out our uh, our insurance, and we basically do a hybrid insure self insure model where we have very high deductibles, you know, um, and that keeps our rates in half. We've been doing that strategy for probably I came up with that strategy about six years ago, mm-hmm. and we've saved about a half a million dollars in actual cash on real estate coverage on on insurance real estate coverage. We saved about a half a million bucks. There we go. And I copied your strategy on that. You're actually the one who told me to adjust my deductibles. But for the uh, for the listener who's hearing this for the first time, why do we have such high deductibles in real estate? How does that how does that save you money? And why is it worth the because uh... stuff does happen? We've already brought it up in this in, in this call. Sometimes you do have to utilize insurance. Uh, why such high deductibles? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, you have to look at, you know, are you going to be an owner operator? And if you are going to be that owner operator, you know, the more the more you're in the business, the more relationships you have, the more contacts you have, uh, you know, you can do things for a fraction of the price of an insurance company. Um, and so it really comes down to if you have the strategy of managing your assets properly by taking care of them and upkeeping them and, you know, making sure that when you get calls about a leak here or, or, a, or a dangerous situation there, when you prove that you address them quickly and when you do address them quickly, then your exposure to a claim is much lower. Um, and quite frankly, you know, if you look at the math and you say, well, if I'm having a 2000 or a thousand, a lot of people have a thousand dollar deductible because they have no idea what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So they have a thousand dollar deductible. They have 300, 500 coverage. I would, I would argue that you need 500, 1 million coverage. Um, the problem is, is that 300, 500 coverage and a thousand dollar deductible, you're probably paying double or triple what I'm paying. And so the idea is <clears throat> to keep your costs lower, but also make sure that you have a partner in the deal because the insurance company is really going to care. Um, and quite frankly, if it's a project under 20,000 bucks, I can probably do it for eight. You know, if the insurance company sees it as 20, I can probably do it for seven or eight. Um, And so why would I file that claim? Because very often what people find that actually then file those claims, the insurance company makes up for it across your portfolio for the next three to five years. It's, it's big. So now could someone mitigate that by switching insurance? Does that insurance company, if you go from one to another, or does that claim just follow you no matter where you go? Yep. The claim follows you, but also not only does the fact that you had a claim against you follow you, um, but now that you're changing companies, a lot of times they're going to introduce a new a, a new premium as well, or you'll get an introductory rate that might be less than the one that you're leaving. But then year two, they're going to get you. So you're going to have to move it again and move it again and move it again. And so you're still moving it with a claim. You're still moving it with a claim that probably stays on your record or on your, on your uh, report about your insurance. Probably stays on there for about five years, depending on which company you're working with. It can be three, five. It can be seven as well. Um, and so... Yeah, it puts you at a significant disadvantage. Uh, so from that perspective, I have insurance for the purpose that most people should have insurance, which is massive loss. And even yeah. then, insurance might not cover you. I've had total loss of building from water damage on a project that was under construction insurance. Oh, oh my word. And there's nothing you can do. It's, they're like, hey, if the roof's over 20 years old and your pipes freeze, no insurance company in the world will cover that. And so just don't let your pipes freeze while you're doing this. And of course we have a frozen <clears> pipe and it cascading issues. Uh, and that's just part of the game. So it's important to know when you're doing this, even with insurance, they may or may not cover the things that you would think they would cover. Like if my pipes burst and water destroys my building, will you cover that? Sure. Well, not like, oh, fantastic. They're, they're, they're super nice to you. So long as you're paying your bill and you're not making any claims. And it's funny as how that you- works. Yeah, it's amazing. As soon as, as you start, they don't have to spend money, but you pay them. Exactly. As soon as you file a claim, let the games begin, and then it's going to be constantly them trying to say, "Well, you didn't live up to this part of the agreement, or that part of the agreement, or here was an issue, or we found, you know, something completely unrelated. We found a dog on the property that actually we don't qualify for. What are we talking about? That that's three units down, and it has nothing to do with the unit that had the issue. Yeah, you know, so it's they're they're looking every single possible way that they can possibly get out of it. And they also recognize that you're likely not going to sue them because they have plenty of lawyers. And you said 145 units is what you're at right now. Mm-hmm. And one of those is a, a prison you're converting, right? Is that, is, is. Is that counting? Okay. I, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about that later too because that's exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to hear the updates on that. As you are building this, so you went from a condo 
Uh-huh. Oh, let's go even further back. You went from dropping out in ninth grade yes. to working low income jobs to eventually you got a high income job. You have this huge portfolio. What things did you do to get from, hey, I got my first few houses and I made my first few sets of mistakes to I have 51 buildings, 145 units. What are the practical steps that you took along that journey? You, say you're talking to someone who has their first few duplexes. How do you go from I'm a beginner to I have no partners, I have a ton of real estate? I think it's, um, for me, it's a general premise of curating an experience for tenants. You know, I want to acquire, I want to stabilize, and then I want to optimize. And I think so often landlords stop at stabilize, and that's where I beat them every time because I bring it to optimize. So they're willing, they're saying, oh, well, yeah, the market's, you know, 8% and I'm making 12, like I'm crushing it. And I'm like, well, congratulations, I'm at 23, 23% return. Well, why are the returns so great? Certainly time has something to do with it. Buying when many others were running has something to do with it. Um, but also having a fa- fairly conservative strategy of I'm going to buy the next one, but I'm not going to be, you know, basically water almost over my nose uh, before I buy the next one. I mean, it's a different deal when you can do what your strategy is, which is, you know, potentially bringing on an equity partner, you know, or talking to the seller and getting seller financing and then getting favorable terms and then getting a no down payment. Like that's magic. Right. That's that's what you're amazing at. And so that's the magic that you use to acquire more assets without actually any without largely any risk, a very, a very low risk profile. And so for me, you know, how do you go from three to 50? It's slow and steady wins the race. I did it in 22 years, not in three years. Um, I do have other people that are investors in my market that I know I'll be buying some of their assets in the next 24 months. Because they grew too quickly. They never really stabilized. They certainly didn't optimize. But really the idea is you acquisition, then stabilization, then optimization. You need to get tenants into the experience, you know, making sure that they're good quality tenants that pay their rent on time. And then over time have other plans of saying, okay, I'm going to have to do the roof there. I'm going to have to do the heating system there. Um, In the turnover of the next set of tenants there, I'm going to redo all the windows because they're older. Um, and really dialing it in. And then when you really get into the weeds on optimization, now you're talking about, you know, toilets and low flow shower heads and on demand hot water heaters and 95% AFUE boilers and really getting nuts. Um, the type of insulation that you use, but you can really get into the weeds on that stuff. But that's how people are like, ah, so, so what? So you made an extra one and a half percent. I said, one and a half percent, 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 one and a half percent. And I was like, so you're right. I only made one and a half percent on that one decision, but I just made seven and a half percent on the cumulative five. That's what optimization looks like. And that's really one of the things that we teach in the course is how to understand how to get from stable to optimized and making sure that, like you guys say, like you say all the time, Christian, you know, how do you get to buy real estate? And more importantly, how can you keep it? I mean, that's what it comes down to, right? You buy cash flow and you make sure you fix your variables so it continues the cash flow. Absolutely. And then you optimize and you increase that cash flow again and again and again. And the market will do some of that. But if you as a landlord come in, I think you worded it perfectly. You're curating the experience for your tenants. Absolutely. They're coming into your brand and your apartments Mm -hmm. and they want to be part of that. And they're always getting better. You Mm -hmm. probably, I'm imagining you have very low turnover compared to your competition. Yeah. We're in the nineties. You know, the, the, the reason any year that we've dipped into like an 80% renewal rate has been because or se- we had a couple of years that were 70%, mm-hmm. but it was because we had so much acquisition Yep. and we wanted to work with those tenants. But so often the reason that the landlord sold us the property was because the tenants were bad. And you very often it's like, you know, th- this is the chain or this is the sliding sliding slope that many people go down, which is. You know, I want to keep my rents fair and reasonable. Okay, great. Cool. No problem. That, that's a good thing. That's very admirable. And then a year later, I want to keep my rents fair and reasonable so I didn't raise the rent. And what it really is, is they're really cowards and they're too afraid to ask for a rent increase. That's what it really is. They're not altruistic. They're cowards. And and that's a rude thing to say. And welcome to the lumberjack landlord. And so, you know, the, the other fact of the matter is, is that people don't want to have those difficult conversations. And so you've got, you know, amazing concepts like Dion talks with his binder strategy, which is amazing. But you find a lot of landlords that what ends up happening is just five years later, the tenant goes, you know what? I'm sick and tired of this. I'm leaving. This place is a dump. They've made more money every single year. They're ready to go rent a nicer place. 
And you're like, why are you leaving? You say, oh, because the place sucks. I want, a nice, I want a nice place to live. And then the landlord's been stuck with having underserved himself and the business. And so they paid a low rate for five years. He doesn't have the money to fix the roof. He doesn't have the money to fix the doors. He doesn't have the money to you know, upgrade the, uh, upgrade the heating system. He doesn't have the money to do that. And then where are you at? Now you're trying to rent out a dingy, dumpy, gross, 17-time painted unit to the next person who is also going to be a low entry tenant. And where are you at then? Then you have zero ability to curate a good experience that you could actually command some sort of a premium for. Um, and the funny thing is, is I think that slumlords, while I hate them and I don't like their business model, mm -hmm. there's a reason that they exist, right? There's yep. a reason they exist. It's because somebody needed a house and that's all they could afford. The problem is, is that that number in the last couple of years has gone up so much because there's no, there's no inventory. And so they're truly the bottom of the rising tide, but it's still lifting all boats. They're just boat. They're just their boats the worst. So I think that that's really the challenge is curating that experience for your tenants, and making sure that hey, if you continue to want to see things improved, I, I need to increase the rent. My taxes go up every year. My water bill goes up every year. My sewer bill goes up every year. All those rates constantly go up. They never go down. You mentioned something that you're going to be buying from people who expanded too fast. Oh yeah, what does expanding too fast look like? Um, I think I think the best analogy I can give people is you know that they're they're buying they're buying the second one and their nose is still around water level. There is a high likelihood that any pressure gets put on your shoulders or your head and you're under. Um, you know, people that buy for appreciation, like sweet lord, don't buy for appreciation. <laughs> yeah, that's, that that is the that is the wrong approach in my mind i think that there's you can do it when you have a large enough portfolio mm -hmm. um you can do it when you can uh, one of the things that you and i really agree on is when you see the when you see the path right you were asked a question on your live stream last night when you see the path from a 120 dscr loan or a 125 dscr loan when you see that path to 150 okay mm -hmm. now it's okay but when you're at a one DSCR and you see the path to 120 or 125, no, no, that's just, that's just lazy. That's just lazy. If you can buy at one and see your way to 175, well, now that's a gamble. That's just a gamble and you just need to have the reserves to do it. With appreciation, unless you're in like a market like Detroit. Yeah. Appreciation is what's going to make you rich in real estate. But yes. you get there by buying for cash flow. You don't right. factor for the appreciation. You don't yeah. bank on the appreciation. You don't know what the market's going to do. All you know is that over a long period of time, you will have appreciation. Because like you said earlier, things get more expensive and mm -hmm. we're going to keep printing money. Like appreciation will multiply the money. It's always happened. Yeah. You completely throw that out and you just go, okay, uh, I'm buying an asset with a liability. If you're, if you're using debt, if you have a bunch of cash, you can play the game a little differently. Of course, but if you're yeah. most of us, uh, mm -hmm. you're buying an asset with a liability that is smaller than the asset that you're buying. That, that That's what you're doing. I'm buying more income with a lower expense than the income I'm buying. I'm fixing my terms, and I'm going to get paid to wait for appreciation. And that's basically the game. We're all just getting paid to wait for appreciation. Matt, mm -hmm. how many years has it been that you've been investing in real estate? Like 22. You, 22. Okay, there you go. 22 and years. I, and I own none of the assets that I started with. Because that's the other thing is you do, you do have to exit. You do have to exit out of some of those asset, assets that you've built up capital and equity in to then utilize that to get a one-to-many. And a one-to-many is I sold one and I bought four others. You know, I did a million-dollar challenge with some other investor buddies of mine. And the idea was buy something for a quarter million bucks, something that was value-add, and it couldn't be like a $500,000 project you needed to do. It needed to be value-add, two fifty, dollars and you had a $50,000 budget to, to fix it up. And I did that, and in one year I sold that thing for five fifty, because I bought the right asset. Sold it for five fifty, and had you know three hundred thousand bucks in profit, and took that three hundred thousand bucks and went out and bought one point one million dollars worth of real estate. So I won the million dollar challenge. There you go. God, that's a fun challenge. I'd, I'd that'd be a, a small project for what I enjoy doing, but that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, that's that's like you'd have to do it at like you know a, a million to five million or something like that. Yeah, yeah, we're doing the uh, we're doing a hotel flip right now that is uh, going actually very well, uh, which is great. We're in budget and everything's moving along, but 
a $1.6 million purchase price. Um, I got $1.8 million of debt on it, though. So that's, you know, effectively, that's my purchase price as far as our numbers are concerned. Uh, looks like we're going to be able to sell it for about 2.5. It'll probably appraise around three. But I'm like, that's $600,000 in like six months. Like, th- these projects are super fun. They're in every city. You can find stuff like this anywhere. And mm-hmm. I found that you have more opportunity in the mid sized stuff because you just have less players trying to buy the same thing. You'd mentioned yeah. earlier, like, you buy when other people stop. I look for asset classes that let just less competition just means you have more room for margin is what I have found consistently through all real estate, uh, which brings me to your prison conversion. I don't know a lot of buyers of prisons. Um, <laughs> ta- me either. <laughs> that's a really exciting project. Talk to me about how that came up, what the vision is for it and where you're at with that project. Yeah. So one of the strategies that we have is we look at old dilapidated buildings that our cities own. Cities need cash. Yes, they, they do. Cash. And if you have a building and the city does, it's a liability to them. You know, they have to send workers there. They have to check up on it. They have to make sure that, you know, it hasn't been broken into and you don't have, <clears throat> you know, squatters or, the, or anything of the like. And so one of the things that we always look at and we always talk to our towns are is, hey, what buildings do you have that you might be taking back on a tax lien or that you already own that is no longer in use? And we talk to them about that. And in this particular case, it was <clears throat> it was a, a, an old police station. Uh, it was perfectly located in a downtown area, uh, been vacant for years. They had just finished the environmental on it. They'd spent about 150 grand on the environmental. Um, and so that cost them an absolute fortune, you know, to do the environmental, 153,000 bucks, because at the end of the day, they look at it as a liability. And so they want to partner with a, with a you know, developer that's going to do the right thing for the community in that type of a building. And so we went to them out of the gate saying, hey, here's our plan. And they loved our plan. We wanted to do, uh, you know, disabled veterans housing. We wanted to do an indoor playground for kids. Uh, in the wintertime, it gets really cold here and kids can't go outside for three or four months. So we wanted to do that kind of cool stuff and, um, and, and a nice little kind of eatery downtown where there aren't a whole lot of, you know, food options. Um, so they loved the idea. And I said, great, the cool thing is now you just have to sell it to me. And so <laughs> we had to go through that process. And basically we brought, um, I, I, presented my offer to the town. They hired an agent. They put it out to bid to hire an agent. Um, I said to the agent, I said, I want this deal. I'm going to make it the best and it's the best thing for the city. And I already invest in the city and they can see the other projects that I've done. Um, you know, we've got a track record. Um, and so we were able to get that building. It's 8,000 square feet. We were able to get the building for 200 grand. Wow. Yeah. And all gutted, no, no EPA, no environmental. It's a hundred percent clean brick building with i joint with uh steel i joists just so that building's not going anywhere no that building is <laughs> fortified it is ready that's fantastic how far through the project are you is it uh are you about to lease up uh the, where's the project at today great question so i bought it in september mm-hmm. and it took until february i took until uh march 18th to get my permits Aha. Uh-huh. So work has just gone underway. Just begun. So we are, uh, I, I, po- I post daily on Lumberjack Landlord on the uh, Instagram, mm. uh, post daily progress that we're making there. So we're resheating all the floors and then we're doing metal studs and we're kind of going through that process now. And uh, next week we have a fire suppression meeting and all these other fun things that we have to do for a building of this size. Um, but yeah, we finally started the work. And so my stated goal to the city was I'm going to finish this project faster than you guys got me permits. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Which is why they love working with me. That's so fun, (laughs) man. Prison into indoor playground. That is, uh, that's going to be quite the, quite the conversion. Uh, Everyone should definitely check it out there. Well, we asked two questions in every pod and you've already answered some of the stupid tax, but we're, we're, we're going to, we're going to get to that one. The first thing I want to know is, so you've done a ton. You've, you've built quite the empire with no partners in not that much time. I mean, a 22-year investing career, that's, that's pretty quick to get the amount of real estate that you have in the position that you're in. What is the thing that you are the best in the world at? What is the thing that makes Matt, Matt, that allowed you to build the business that you did? Uh, I think chaos management. The ability to manage chaos. Uh, it's... Uh... You know, when not not anything really goes your way in real estate investing. So it's a matter of creating 
creating processes, being willing to pivot, not being steel-headed about or iron-headed about certain things. Um, it really comes down to how do I buy it? How do I stabilize it? How do I optimize it? And then what, what processes and efficiencies can I create around that that allow me to keep it and reduce the amount of drag that I have from asset to asset so I can buy the next one? You know, we self-manage. I have one full-time person that helps me. But until six weeks ago, I had a, I had a 50 hour a week executive job. So I think the superpower is, yep, you have to be able to manage, manage chaos. You have to be able to learn how to pivot and you have to understand that the core mission is acquisition, stabilization, optimization, and then creating systems and processes around that where the right thing happens based on your systems and processes. That way you're only making minor tweaks as opposed to having the major wholesale changes having to be consistently made. The reason people don't buy real estate, I think the number one reason is that they are too stressed about all the things that can happen. And what you just said nails it on the head. Uh, most of those things are going to happen at some point when you buy real estate. Things yep. will go wrong and some of them will go catastrophically wrong. Yep. Chaos management, the question I have is how do you handle the stress that gut-wrenching like, oh my goodness, are we declaring bankruptcy this month or are we gonna find a way through this? How do you handle that? Especially now in your position as you know, you're, you're a father, you're a husband, how do you handle the stress of having that much business? Um, I think, you know, um, not to get corny, but I think, you know, probably a little bit of faith ha has, a, you know, plays, plays a role in it for sure. Um, you know, recognizing that all you can do is your best and that the, the only outcome that's guaranteed is that you're going to get an outcome. So you work to do your very best. You recognize that you're not perfect. You recognize you're going to make mistakes. Um, as the years go on, you're, you got to be humble and learn, recognize that you can learn from everybody. Um, you know, you're 15 years younger than me and have done things that I've never done. And I think that, you know, that's why I watch you and I try and learn from you. And I watch from a lot of different investors because I always want to be learning about different angles. Like if you, if you have 15 different angles that you can do a deal based on, well, then you're going to constantly have deals in front of you that you can select from. If you're only buying out of MLS, I've got bad news. The market <laughs> is going to dictate what you what you can and can't do. And so I think it's, you know, I think, you know, handling that stress, it really comes down to always being well-intentioned, always trying to do the right thing, recognizing that you don't know everything, recognizing you're going to give it your best. And at the end of the day, there was nothing I could do about the lead order. It was just, okay, you know, uh, hey, guy, I'm really sorry this happened. Let's understand it and figure out how we can put this together. And I think people also heard on the other end of the line that I wasn't joking. I was very serious. I said, I'm probably gonna have to file bankruptcy and I'm just gonna have to give you back the building and you're just gonna have to figure it out. And I said, I and I don't want that to happen, being transparent. I don't want that to happen. But why make it adversarial? It's not like that person on the other side of the phone has any power whatsoever to do anything. It's like yelling at a cashier or yelling at a waitress. What's the point? They don't own the problem. They didn't cook your food. They didn't screw up the steak. Somebody back in the kitchen did. And they have the covering of that kitchen door. So I think it's just being well-intentioned. And I think it's also recognizing you don't know everything. Usually um, high success people, they're toughest critics themselves. And so usually you're giving yourself the worst of it over what anybody else is doing. And, and recognize too that, hey, you know what? Whatever. I, I, there's nothing. Worrying is not going to add a moment, a, a moment of value to my day or to my life. So worry. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of the wrong guy. I just, just says what it is. You do your best and you figure it out from there. That is the mark of almost every successful investor is you just realize like you can only play with the pieces you have. I think stress and worry and all that stuff uh, makes sense if you're trying to survive like being eaten as a uh, hunter gatherer. As you get into business, a lot of the emotion things do not help you at all. Uh, the way that you feel doing business does not dictate your actions. And the people who can stomach that are typically the ones who end up owning a lot of real estate or otherwise having a very successful business. I think that stress management thing, it, is that something that you learned or is that something you're born with? I think it's something that you can learn. I mean, I was a teenager with a panic disorder. <laughs> 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 you know, so, um, uh, you know, I think that based on, based on that being the occurrence, I think that it is something you can learn. You just recognize 
listen, I'm going to be here tomorrow. This isn't the thing that ends me, you know, and that's why I get so sad when, when somebody makes the decision to, to, to take their future into their hands, like in a, in a negative way. Mm -hmm. It's, I, I promise it's not that bad. It's just not that bad. It's not that bad. You'll be okay. It's not that bad. I have very successful friends who have gone through bankruptcies or other yep. total complete failure and you still make it through and you're alive another day and you just keep building. Uh, now the design of the portfolio is to not lose it. That is kind of the premise of the whole sure. thing. Buy it and don't lose it. But if you do, yeah, th those are the pieces. And then you just keep pressing forward with the pieces that you have. You learn something. Yep. I, I, I love that mentality. Speaking of, the highest stupid tax you had to pay talking about managing stress uh, for mm -hmm. all the problems that have happened in the portfolio mm -hmm. while you're learning how to play the game. What was the highest stupid tax that Matt had to pay? This could be monetary. It could be emotional. Uh, but what was the highest tax in playing the real estate game? I mean, it, it, it's tough to narrow it down to just one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's uh you know, not understanding how how bad a lead order could be was really bad. Not understanding how dangerous investing in a property in an HOA was really bad. Um, you know, people doing what was expected and not inspected. The thing that I always preach with my guys um, is people do what's inspected, not expected. And so if they don't think that you're coming around and looking and taking a look at it, that you are going to get less than quality work and they're not going to make you a priority. So I think, you know, the, the stupid tax continues to work its way into any person's business. And I think the idea is, is okay, I've learned the lesson and you know, now we mitigate that. And so, but let orders, you can't really do a whole lot about where we are. You know, I think investing in an HOA, I think, yeah, I think my, my biggest ones are ones that um, I, it was, was something I just didn't know. And it came back to get me. And so I think people should, you know, measure three times and cut once. And I think that that a lot of times, you know, never do a deal for the sake of doing a deal. Do a deal because mm. you have a conviction that you're going to actually make the asset a, a, a quality, a quality asset. Yeah. And that goes back to not being emotional, right? Just don't yeah. be emotional about the deal. The, the deal that you found isn't the deal that you have to close. Nope. Um, you know, on the same token one problem in your deal isn't necessarily a reason why it's going to be too scary and you have to back out. Like look at, look at the deal for what the deal is. And if the deal makes sense, close the deal. And if it doesn't make sense, find another deal. It, it is that simple. People get very emotional about real estate, especially when you're new and you know, at the end of the day, it's an investment. It shouldn't be any more emotional than buying a stock. It's the, it's just, Hey, I think this is going to work. I have good reason for why I think it's going to work. And I have uh -huh. a plan to do it. That's why you would close a property. If it's, yeah. hey, I, I've been, I'm in Matt's mentorship group and I haven't bought anything yet in my first three months. I better close this next deal. That is the wrong reason to buy a piece of real estate. Wrong. wrong. It's just wrong. Yeah. You know, I, I, I love the students that get in, right? And I'm like, how much real estate do you own? None. I love it. I love it. And your course focuses a lot on real estate management, right? It's more than that. Right. More so than acquisition. So people who own no real estate are going like, okay, I, go, I want to learn how to manage this real estate that I don't own yet. You, what you does that buy, look like for a new student who doesn't own anything, who's taking a yeah. class on how to run their real estate? What does that look like so, for you mentoring them? So you buy in this amount of time mm -hmm. and you manage in this amount of time and my hand's perfectly off, purposely off screen, <laughs> right? You just, it's, it's, it's 10X, it's 20X, right? And so what it really looks like is Hey, when you're shopping, here's how you make a, a compelling offer. You know, here's when you get the tenants, here's the first thing you're going to do. I mean, literally the name of the course is, oh shit, I'm a landlord. Now what? <laughs> That's how I felt at the closing table. I was like, I, I don't, I, I don't have, I, I'm, I don't have keys to all the units. What am I doing? <laughs> I, was, I didn't even have keys, like an estoppel. I had no idea what that was. You know, and so really it's just managing and guiding them through the process of, okay, when you finally do that buy, you're going to have to engage the tenant. You're going to have to engage the city. You're going to have to, you know, look at what repairs need. You, you know, have you talked to other plumbers saying, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, uh, I'm, I'm looking at purchasing some properties, was wondering if when that right property does come up, if I could have you come in and take a look at the, the plumbing and the heating system. The mis biggest mistake that newbies make is that they actually take the word for some of these guys who took five-day courses and being inspectors. 
You know, mm-hmm. what an absolute joke that is. What an absolute joke. Five days and you know everything you need to know about inspecting a building? No. So I bring the experts. I bring my plumber. I bring, you know, my uh, my electrician. And I'm just like, hey, listen, I need you to come by because any work that you're going to get out of this deal, I want to know now. And so I don't even hire inspectors. I hire the guys who actually do my work. And so that way when they're coming in, they're looking at it and going, yeah, this is going to be a problem or you need to upgrade this or this isn't code. You know, that way I know going into it. And then it's not a matter of, well, it was in the inspector's report. I'll usually have like an overall like general purpose guy. Mm -hmm. But then I have the plumber's stuff go through there and they're there for an hour. So I might pay for my plumber for an hour and 25 bucks, 125 bucks, my electrician for a hundred bucks and then the inspector for five or 600 bucks. And so I might be 800 bucks in, but I'd rather know right then and there that I've got a $10,000 electrical problem or a $3,000 plumbing problem. And in all likelihood, from a negotiation perspective, it's not coming from an inspector. It's coming from a plumber or from an electrician. And so it carries a lot more weight when I'm actually negotiating the deal as well. And that is the best way to do it. If you have, especially if you're doing these value add projects, like yeah, sure. get the actual professionals in there, get actual quotes. And yeah. you'll notice that your numbers change a lot on your deal when you do this. You don't want to be surprised after you close. You want to have that surprise during due diligence, which is why we push so hard on great due diligence once you're under contract. I mean, if it looks good, go ahead and get it under contract. You verify everything during due diligence. And the more you do in that period, the more consistent your deal is going to be. And that is the goal. Eliminate variables every single time. Variables are what kill you. Stack the deck in your favor. Matt, this has been a really fun episode. Again, the goal of this podcast is just to connect people with other owners who are farther in the game. You are farther in the game than most will ever get. So when we're looking at all the things that you've done, the things that you've done wrong, things you've done right, if you can learn a few of these things, save yourself a few hundred dollars, a few hundred thousand dollars, uh, you know, save yourself that eighty thousand uh, dollar penalty on your three hundred sixty thousand dollar condo uh, by just not buying condos. Like, if you got nothing out of this, like even that right there, you're like, wow, uh, condos off the list. I'm a better investor than I was before I listened to this. Yeah. Um, we launch this every single week. We have new investors. Follow this anywhere that you follow podcasts on Spotify, uh, on the YouTube channel, Multifamily Strategy. At some point, Apple will accept this. So at some point, Apple Podcast. Uh, But listen to these weekly. Matt, if someone wants to find you online, I know you have YouTube, Instagram, you have your course. Uh, Where would someone go to find you if they want to learn more from you? Lumberjack Landlord on YouTube. We like to give back to the community and to the next generation of investors. And so we do a live stream every Sundays, every Sunday for uh, between 90 minutes and, and, uh, and two hours. And we just answer questions. And that's how we help people. Um, and then if they feel like they need more time or they feel like they've got a deal that they really want to better understand, um, then you can step up into the course. Or if you feel like you're a decent landlord and you're okay at stabilizing, but you're not getting to optimization, Again, that's what the course is there to help for. So I like giving back and spending an hour and a half to two hours just answering people's questions Sundays on my live stream on my YouTube channel. And then uh, Project Updates is where we do a lot of stuff on Instagram, just saying, hey, here's what it looked like, here's what it is, and here's what we did. There we go. And Matt has helped me on Section 8 questions, on partnership questions, on insurance questions, on about any question I have on real estate. Uh, Matt has been a mentor for me in a lot of the things that I have done personally. So it's a huge privilege to have you on the channel. Everyone, give him a follow, especially on YouTube, because I think that is just the best possible place to follow him. Uh, Matt's not kidding. He shares everything there. So... Check them out, YouTube, Lumberjack Landlord. This has been another episode of the Multifamily Strategy Podcast. We will see you on the next episode.